All right, hello and welcome back to Introduction to Animal Behavior with Mr. Henley. We're on Unit 1, Section 4. We're going to call this section Sociobiology. And you can kind of sort of already get an idea of what that's about. So it's the evolution, study of the evolution of social behaviors. And this has the idea that genes, particularly those that are associated with behaviors, are the units that natural selection acts upon. Again, remember, we're all about behavior in this course. We're not talking about colors and things like that unless it affects behavior. So it's the behavior is genetically passed on, and it's kind of hard to see a verb being expressed as a gene. Normally we think of genes as nouns, you know, objects, things, features. In this case, we're talking more about behaviors. But this is often referred to as the selfish gene, which we mentioned earlier with E.O. Wilson a little bit, but a lot of this was popularized by Richard, uh, Richard Dawkins back in 1976. So like I said, a few decades ago. Um, this selfishness is not emotional or moral or anything like that. It's not like trying to be selfish to the detriment of everything and everyone else. Instead, it has to do with reproductive fitness and propagating themselves. It's the idea of we're trying to appear selfish because it increases in frequency. It's not actually being selfish. It's, you know, trying to look out and survive and pass yourself on is what we really mean by the um, selfishness. So these adaptations are traits that are associated with the highest relative fitness in any given environment and refers to traits that natural selection will act upon and usually helps match an organism to its environment. So let's talk about this in a case study of anti-predator behavior in guppies. And this gets a little detailed and bear with me for a minute because we're going to explain this. So what we have is we have two sites. There's a upstream site, and then there's a waterfall that goes down, and we have a downstream site. Okay, so there's two sites. There's two little lakes, creeks, what have you. And this is showing you the upstream site, and this is considered low predation, meaning that there is not as many predators in this area that's upstream. Okay, this is upstream of a waterfall. Okay, so two fish really, you know, the fish could go from upstream to downstream, but not likely to go backwards. Okay, so the guppy, which if you're probably not familiar with, my great grandmother used to buy these when she was alive years ago, uh, Pacilia reticula, um, reticulata. Um, actually, C's in Latin are all hard, so I guess it would be Pocilia reticulata, but um, who knows how they want to pronounce it. Um, it's often used in animal behavior studies, they breed quickly. It allows lots of generational studies. You really want things that breed very quickly. That's why flies and mice and things like that are used so often because they breed quickly and you can see the effects of generations um, in a relatively short amount of time. A lot of guppies um, used in the studies come from the northern mountains of Trinidad and Tobago, both upstream and downstream of a series of waterfalls. So upstream has very weak predation pressure. There's not very many um, predators there. And if there are, they are relatively small, whereas downstream you're going to have a lot more predation. There's just more prey for the predators to eat, so the predators tend to be a little bit bigger. So this is the upstream site. This is the downstream site, so we're downstream. doesn't really look very much different from what you can tell. It looks like a creek. You get the idea. These can only be a few kilometers apart, not very far in the grand scheme of things, but there's very little gene flow between these two sites. Thus, they have variation in their traits, and these traits include things like the coloration of the males, the anti-predator behaviors, and so forth. So let me put this image up here. I think this image really helps show this. So what we have going on here is we have this predator of the guppies, at the low predation site. So the low predation site is this creek, this river that's up here at the top, and then down the waterfall to another creek, river, lake area, which is the high predation site. Okay. Notice that we have the prey and the guppies. Um, the guppies are prey in both situations. Um, upstream, we have the rivulus harty, which is the predator there, whereas downstream, we have the crincicala alta, I'm I'm butchering the name that we see going on there. Okay, you can notice they've they're already starting to indicate some of the trends we're going to see here. So if you like it, look at the number of babies that each guppy has at each location. That's one of the um, things to be aware of as we move forward. Um, notice and it tells you right here as well. But we're going to move on. So I think this picture for me really helped. I was like, why in the world they talk about upstream and downstream? Why can't they just swim back upstream? Oh, that's why. It's a waterfall. They can't go up the waterfall. They're not salmon. So anyway. Uh, so these high pre um, 
predation sites. So on the bottom rung where there's big predators, lots of going to eat up all the guppies. The guppies have responded um, their behavior appropriately. They mature very fast. You, you got to grow up fast. You're, you're in an area where you're likely to get eaten. Um, they have lots of um, offspring, big broods of lots of little bitty offspring. And those offspring have got to get big as quick as they can. And the reason for this, obviously, is if the predators are eating them, then there's more likely that, you know, if you have 10 children, they're more like one's more likely to survive than if you had three children, you know, not so likely that one's going to survive. And this channels more, re they channel more resources towards re reproduction. Not to mention the fact that predators are so big here. Let's go back for a second. That predator is so big, it doesn't matter how big you are, the parents are, or any of y'all are, they're going to eat you, okay? But if we look at the low predation site, you do reach a point where the fish are big enough that they're not as likely to be eaten. So that's another thing to keep in mind as we move forward here. So more offspring offers more chance for survival for at least one. At the low predation site, we have, um, they have to, the guppies, if they get past a certain size, if they get big enough, they're too big to eat and they're safe from the hardy, uh, from that predator. So natural selection tends to favor females that produce fewer offspring so they can devote more resources to those offspring. And then those offspring can get big enough, quick enough, in order to um, get large enough to avoid being predated or eaten by the predator. Now there's two predator behaviors that these fish will um, do as well. So we talk, again, this is of course about behavior. So we're talking about what can the fish do to avoid being eaten. And one of the things they can do is what's called shoaling, which we've also heard of as called schooling. This is the, sw the fish swimming together in a group. There's safety in numbers. Um, not to mention, you know, so shoaling is kind of hard for the, you know, to be, um, for the predator to focus in on one, it's easier for them to survive. And if you know, and if one of y'all gets eaten, at least the rest can survive and get away, right? So this is seen more downstream in the high predation site. Also, predator inspection. This is the tendency of individuals to move towards a predator. So in the previous section, we were talking about ravens um, inspecting novel objects. And like some ravens would do it in 30 seconds, some in 60, some in 120. Same thing goes here. Typically, the downstream guppies, if they see a fish that could be a potential predator, they're going to hang back. They're like, whoa, wait a second. I don't know what that is. I don't know if I want to get close to that or not. Whereas those in the low predation site are more likely to approach this a lot more quickly and could potentially get eat up in that case. So we have the low predation site up here. We have the high predation site down there. And again, this, this graphic just helps s summarize all of that. Uh, the females produce fewer but bigger offspring. So notice there's only like five, um, the word is um, fry. They usually are referred to as fry, the baby fish, I believe. Um, and whereas over here, you know, it's like it's a good dozen or dozen and a half of fry over there. Um, and again, the females are going to produce lots and lots of offspring because it's 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 a game of numbers at this point. You know, here we want to reproduce. We want to grow and get big here. We're just trying to produce and survive. It's pretty rough. Um, so there was some other experiments that came about with this. And we'll explain more in just a second. So I'll use this graphic to show is what if you take the guppies from the low predation site and introduce them to the high predation site and vice versa? What if you take the high predation site guppies and put them in the low predation site? The question is, does this behavior continue or does it change up a little bit in these various areas? So um, this was done in the early 1990s by Ann McGurran and her colleagues, and they discovered a chance to kind of do a natural experiment because see what happened in 1957, a guy named, um, I think it was a guy, C.P. Haskins had transferred 200 guppies from a high predation site, which again is down here in the bottom, to um, in the Aramea River to a low predation site in the Taror River that had previously been unoccupied by guppies. So he took guppies from an area that they were used to the high predation behaviors, you know, produce fast, lots of babies, you know, be very cautious in approaching things. And he put them in an area where there had never been guppies before. And when he did this, um, they randomly sampled the Tarur River, um, McGurran did from 1957, so it was the 90s. This is almost 40 years later, 35, 40 years later, and determined the high predation fish had spread throughout. 
these fish had also showed shoaling and predator inspection behaviors more similar to the low predation sites than that of their ancestors. So even though they came from the high predation sites where they were more likely to school, shoal, and they were more likely to be very cautious in their predator inspections, these fish were actually behaving more like the low predation fish, even though they genetically came from this. So it's like you know their behavior changes to match their environment, essentially. Um, one more thing as well was in addition to colonizing the low predation areas, they had also moved back downstream into areas of the high predation pressure. So these fish, again, these were originally high predation fish that had offspring that went into the low predation area and they acted like low predation fish. Those low predation fish from the high predation fish then moved into a high predation area. <laughs> kind of all over the place, right? And these fish exhibited behaviors more similar to their ancestors. So basically, if the fish are in an area of high predation, they act a certain way. They tend to school, they are slow to inspect new predators, they have lots and lots of babies very quickly. Whereas if they're in a low predation site, they do those behaviors as well. I almost need like a graphic up here that says these are the low predations, these are the high predations, and these are how they act. So um, there's a lot of things we could go into. So the idea for this is that maybe the colonizer spreads so fast that they retain their behaviors when encountering the high predation areas. So maybe they colonize very, very quickly and they were like, oh, we know what we need to do here. We need to have lots of babies really fast. We need to be slow at approaching, that type of thing. Um, but the question, um, underlies here, what if they had colonized very slowly? Would there have been enough time, enough generations between these individuals that maybe they would have forgotten the behaviors that had made them successful in the previous high predation area? Um, don't really know. So it's kind of interesting to see how these organisms behave together and how their environment played a role in them as they got moved from one place to another. So. I've been talking a little bit long and uh, we're gonna try to keep this section short for a change. So let me stop the video here and I'll see you after the click. Um, I wish I had a video of this to show you, but unfortunately I haven't been able to find anything as of yet.